a, a quick introduction. Um, the EC50, our motto is 50 people who are changing the world that the world needs to know about. And this was really born from the pandemic. And uh, our um, past honorary president, Bertrand Picard, once said that, you know, the idea behind any crisis is to end up better than when you started. And so during the pandemic, we had plenty of time to reflect who we want to be going forward in the future. So the first year of the pandemic, a lot of things were happening. We had the Black Lives Matter um, a protest going on just really down the block. Um, everybody was on Zoom calls, and we had time to reflect. And, you know, uh, I had many conversations with uh, Richard Garriott and uh, Fania Rose, our media past president, and, you know, other members of the board. And, you know, we came to sort of the conclusion that we kept every year honoring the same great explorers. And while I think that's really great to have, uh, and I'll say this to the EC50 people for when you come up here, Jane Goodall has had her hands on this lectern. Neil Armstrong has had her hands on this. Eel Wilson. I mean, I can go down the list of great people. But we thought that, you know, how do we develop the next Eo Wilsons or Jane Goodalls or Kathy Sullivans, all of these great people? And in our conversations, all of us had come to the conclusion that we had all met really outstanding people in our travels, people who were just doing fantastic work and generally receiving at least no greater recognition from this organization. And, and that's really how the genesis of it uh, came. And, and you're always wondering, you know, how will the membership receive this? And, and I can say that they received it a lot better than in 1981 when they decided to uh, ask women to come into the club at that time, because I, I'm a member from the 80s. Some, you know, you'd meet some of these old guys go, oh, this club used to be so much better, <laughs> you know, the whole thing. You know, we, we also feel that, um, you know, the idea of reflecting a greater pool of exploration. You know, when I was a boy, my story of, you know, looking over the horizon or at, a, at an ocean or a lake and wondering what was on the bottom of it or on top of it or, or any of these things, you know, it's just not the domain of somebody who grows up in the Northeast or it's not the domain of a man, it's not the domain of a European American. You know, everybody dreams and we feel that, um, you know, exploration or curiosity is a mosaic of a lot of different people. And one, you know, quick story, um, too, is during that whole time I'd started a correspondence. Oh, here's our other chair, Joe Rohde, and I'll introduce him in a second. If you want to uh, meet somebody who definitely thinks differently, Joe is that person. And Joe, um, I'll have him come up in a second. But um, someone had shown me a, um, a video called Earthrise, and it was uh, done by a, a young poet named Amanda Gorman. And uh, this is pre-Joe Biden inauguration, Amanda Gorman. And I looked at it, and I thought, you know, the way she is describing the fragility of planet Earth is, 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 you know, by her poetic uh, passages, is so different from what I've heard from other PhDs or astronauts. And I thought, you know, it's so important that people describe what they see at a level to an audience that people can accept or identify with. So if I were to, um, you know, go to Tanzania, and start describing uh, something to somebody from a Maasai thing, you know, he's probably going to look at me as a Mazunga Maku. Um, I, I don't know if anybody knows that term. Anybody know what a Mazunga Maku is? A great white chief. <laughs> you know, opposed to somebody from there uh, reflecting. So, you know, the Explorers Club uh, 50 is really here to reflect um, that, that greater uh, variety of Earth, and we feel like if we're going to solve the problems of Earth, we, we need people. All right, so I've what they've called vamped enough to get everybody to be seated. Um, one of the most important things that I learned during this whole process of looking at applications came from Joe Rohde. Uh, Joe, please stand. Joe was the head Imagineer at Disney. So Joe challenged, this is how Joe challenged the group. He said, 
if you take the same people with the same premises and you look at a problem, you will always get the same result. And so Joe um, encouraged us and challenged us to redefine what exploration is on who says it, whether it be art or poetry or, you know, a whole magnitude of things. In fact, Joe, I wasn't sure that you were coming here, but I'm going to let you describe that challenge and then we'll get into the speaker. So I, this is uh, Joe Rode, the co-chair of the EC50. So. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. I'll, I'll say this briefly, but I think it is really um, – it's a fascinating process. You know, the whole process of exploration is sort of broken down into two ideas, the X, which is to go out, and the plore, which is to speak. Uh, and both of those are influenced by who's doing the looking, who's doing the exploring, who's doing the speaking. When you change the eyes uh, that are looking, you're going to change what you see through exploration. And while this, of course, has impact on what we might learn and see about the outer world more profoundly, this has impact on how we see ourselves. As we change the constitution of our own eyes, the constitution of our own minds, as we look at ourself, this place, this place, so established, so well understood, so familiar, becomes again a new place that's worth exploring, a place that you can look at uh, by looking within. And this to me is the real, uh, the true field of exploration uh, that opens when we begin to redefine exploration itself. And by redefining exploration, redefine who is qualified uh, to, to, to be an explorer, it changes the world we inhabit. Not just the world out there, but the world of our own community, the world of this place, the world of the Explorers Club. Thank you for unprepared speech. I hope that was Joe, Joe, this is the first time I've heard you give a speech without using the term alchemy. That's your, fi that's, that's your favorite term. Um, for our EC honorees who are here, um, I think the, the sort of familiar happy face that um, was the, the sort of interface between uh, a larger panel of people like Joe and myself was Lacey Flint. So I'd like to recognize Lacey Flint here. Lacey would come in and says, you, you've got to read this application. I mean, time and time again, um, she, you know, um, many people, we, we've heard this from several uh, honorees of this, that they have what they call imposter syndrome. And I have to tell you, after reading some of these applications, I have imposter syndrome. I'm like, holy cow, these people are really doing terrific work. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out, you know, Whenever you do these things, they just don't happen by sprinkling a little water and hoping it grows. It takes people who also believe in it and people who are going to financially back it. The f very first people I went to, I can say I went to Discovery, and immediately they gave us money to uh, promote this. They, they said, fantastic. Our friends at Rolex, same thing, and both are continuing to support. We had individuals like Fanya Rose and I don't know if me Treadwell's here and Richard Garriott, all of them said, you know, we think this is the most important thing we do at the club, and we would like to, you know, make sure that this uh, program continues and it and continues to feed our club. So, uh, Lacey, I'm going to have you come up here, and, and really I want to give Lacey a big round of applause because – Four hundred applications, four hundred applications from members, and it's not an easy job putting them together. And 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 as she, she can tell you, that getting explorers together to do things is like herding cats. They they sort of don't like to be told what to do. So, so Lacey, thank you very much. You. And I'll let you begin. I'm not speaking at all. I just want to shout out Brooke, Luis, and Serrano, our amazing team in the back. Thank you for everything. Um, I'm thrilled to have everybody here. We're going to kick it off with the amazing Emily Hazelwood and Amber Sparks. If you guys could come on up. Good morning. 
morning, everyone. Wow. I think they're going to be setting up our slides here. Yeah, it is. Oh. It's not showing. <laughs> Let's see. There there we go. Go. All right, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Hazelwood. And I'm Amber Sparks. And we're marine conservation biologists and co-founders of Blue Latitudes. Blue Latitudes is a women-owned marine environmental consulting firm, and we specialize in converting offshore oil platforms into artificial reefs. And today we're going to be telling you a little bit about why we do that. There are offshore oil platforms found in almost every single ocean on the planet. And at some point, all of these platforms will need to be removed. Completely removing an, an offshore oil platform is costly and environmentally taxing, especially when you consider the marine ecosystems, brilliantly colored fish, scallops, and anemones found on these structures. But there is an alternative. There's an opportunity to repurpose these platforms as artificial reefs. And we've already started to do this. More than 600 offshore oil platforms have been repurposed as artificial reefs in the Gulf of Mexico, in Malaysia, and in Thailand. When an oil platform is reefed, the upper portion of the structure is removed, the wells are sealed and capped, and this jacket structure, so what's below the water, is left in place to support the marine life as an artificial reef. Many of these platforms have been studied for decades, and in California, they've been found to be some of the most productive habitats on the planet, more productive than mangroves or than even some coral reef ecosystems. And the secret really lies in the structure itself, made of galvanized steel. The beams and cross beams stretch from seafloor to sea surface, creating a lot of real estate complexity that attracts marine life. Here in California, we see scallops and anemones, schools of jack mackerel, and we even see some of our state saltwater fish, the Garibaldi, that nest and make their permanent home on these platforms. But when it comes time to decommission, this is a very intensive offshore endeavor. It's like removing something the size of the Empire State Building from the seafloor. It's technically challenging, costly, and can have some significant impacts on the environment, especially if these platforms have been functioning as reefs. So Riggs Reef provides an alternative to completely removing that jacket through which an oil company can modify the structure so that it will continue to support marine life as an artificial reef. Through a Riggs to Reef approach, the, wheel, the wells are always sealed and capped, and the oil companies retain, retain liability for those wells, so should there ever be a leak or a spill, they're always responsible. And the, what you see from your beach chair or the top side is removed. So it's really just that platform jacket that's either toppled on its side, can be towed to an area of ecosystem need, or the upper 80 feet are removed to allow ships to safely draft over. No matter which decommissioning option is selected, the purpose of a rigs to reef decommission platform is to retain approximately six acres of habitat per structure and allow this platform to function and help marine life to continue to thrive as an artificial reef. And there's also some significant cost savings, approximately one billion in cost savings per, per the platforms in California. And in accordance with Riggs to Reef law, a big portion of that cost savings goes back to the state. So approximately 800 million would go back to the state of California into an endowment for marine preservation and conservation to fund Department of Fish and Wildlife and other state fund initiatives if 23 of our 27 platforms were to be reefed. But what about the East Coast? We don't have offshore oil platforms, but we know what's coming, offshore wind turbines. And in some locations, they're already here. As we continue to shift away from our reliance on offshore oil and gas, wind has quickly become one of the fastest growing energy sectors on the planet. And if you look at these structures, you'll notice they look a little bit like their offshore oil platform cousins, albeit the energy that's produced is much, much cleaner. And this is video that was captured off of one of the wind turbines in Block Island that were constructed not too long ago. And you'll note that the marine life has slowly begun to 
be attracted to this type of structure and will eventually begin to produce in quality that we hope will match what we see on our offshore oil platforms. But a little bit more about Blue Latitudes. We're a women-owned marine environmental consulting firm. We were started in 2015 after Amber and I met at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Since our inception, we've worked in over four countries working on repurposing oil platforms as permanent artificial reef structure, preserving the lives of thousands of fish individuals and more than 24 acres of habitat. But we'd love to hear from you. You can feel free to reach out to us on our website or contact us at emily at bluelatitudes.org, amber at bluelatitudes.org, or check out our social media channels. Thanks so much. <laughs> So this is uh, ever so slightly terrifying. Um, so I'm obviously Tom. And speaking of imposters, I'm not entirely sure that I should be associated with that title of a presentation, to be totally honest. Um, but I, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I was in the BBC World Affairs Unit covering war, natural disaster, and all of that stuff before moving into environmental filmmaking, protection of wild spaces and wildernesses, and umbrella animal species. Um, so I'm assuming I just, there we go. Oh. Oh. Is there a way to reset this? This is, oh, there we go. Um, so, um, so my, my background originally was um, military, so I. Oh no, it's good. I'm good. Um, so I, I, I uh, served as combat search and rescue in Afghanistan for two tours, and what I learned from that was that um, my job was basically to fly into firefights and battles, pick people up, and try and keep them alive and drop them into hospital. And what I learned from that was that it wasn't important enough and that small groups of motivated people can stop empires and make enormous changes to the world. Um, I left the military to join the BBC, and I continued to cover war, uh, where I, I worked in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, worked undercover to find Jihadi John's uh, family, um, did a whole load of things like that. But one of, the, one of the significant things that I noticed everywhere I went, and in 2015 of 37 countries, Every single place I went, people were saying, I can no longer farm, or the weather's changed, or the seasons are unpredictable, my whole crop has disappeared. And then I was on the border between Nigeria and Cameroon in a place that is basically completely unexplored. It's, there's a huge piece of forest that's 7,000 square kilometers on the edge of Nigeria, and no human has set foot in most of it. And there's a tiny Fulani village in, in this huge wilderness. 
Um, and this was a piece that I filmed there. Okay, so that was significantly out of sync and not a, <laughs> not a proper reflection of the editorial quality that we produce. Um, but uh, the people that are facilitating the saviour of this park are the rangers. And what, what I learned from my time in the BBC and travelling all over the world with them was that the people that protect wildernesses and wild spaces are some of the most important people in the world and their stories, I believe, are the most important stories in the world. And so we, I set up a company um, where we, we take cinema quality cameras, cameras that are normally preserved for Hollywood and shooting movies, and we take them to the world's most remote places and we film with the people that really need proper recognition. And it's not about you know, having the person creating the film on camera or having a presenter. It's entirely about them and telling their stories in an authentic, unjudgmental way. Um, and that's what we do, basically. So I've got a... So this, yeah, that's Kashaka, a place in Nigeria. Um, and this, so one of the shots in the film I'm about to show you, which the, the film is kind of, uh, it's not really a reflection of the type of documentaries we do, but it does show a fairly important bit of how tourism and protecting wild spaces connect. Um, and there's a certain shot in there that you'll see, which is one of the opening shots. And this, this is how we shot it. So it's, it's literally me with a state-of-the-art camera on a gimbal that you can put in a backpack and we would walk for 40 kilometers to get to the location with the rangers to film what they do in an authentic way we don't have crews of 50 people it's literally me and a friend that I was on the helicopters and I kind of stand with um, so this is an example of what we what we produce I'm not sure I dare press play here in case it
You know, it's funny, we can... Donna. Huh? I did it. Thank you, Tom. That was awesome. Sorry about the audio. Um, Dr. Sean of Handy. Oh, there you are. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We're just going to wait for the slides to get going. Uh, I did not have imposter syndrome before those first two presentations. I do now. So uh, maybe I'll get going uh, while we're waiting for this to go ahead. Don't click? Don't click. Okay. Just The best advice I once received during medical training was um, stand back and resist the urge to do anything. So I'll do that right now. All right, so we have six minutes, 25 slides, and a whole lot of caffeine, so I'm just going to jump right into it. My name is Shauna. I am from Canada, and my game is face medicine, uh, something I truly love doing. And one of the first questions I always get asked when I tell people I'm into space medicine is, what do those two things have to do with each other? Which is a very reasonable first question until we delve a little bit deeper and we think about the hazards of the space flight environment. And briefly speaking, crash course into space medicine, when we talk about the big five challenges of going to space. Um, at a very high level, this includes altered gravity, so whether it's weightlessness on the International Space Station to one-sixth gravity on the moon, every single bodily system is affected by altered gravity. So our bones lose density, our muscles lose mass, uh, our fluid shift up to flip fluid shifts upwards, putting more pressure on our brains and around our eyes. There's increased exposure to radiation, which can have short-term and long-term effects. The further out we go, the more independent we need to be. So by the time we get to Mars, we're dealing with, at times, a 46-minute round-trip delay. And then we're isolated and confined from the creature comforts of Earth. There's no Starbucks on Mars, unfortunately. Everything else which falls under hostile environments, so that can be lunar dust that the Apollo astronauts had to contend with, altered day-night cycles, so 16 sunrise sunset cycles per 24 hours on the International Space Station. So all of this is to say, if you take nothing away from this part of the presentation, is simply that space is trying to kill you. <laughs> so... Why do we care about this? This isn't just a theoretical concept. It's not just for fun, but it's because the international space community, led by the space agencies as well as by the commercial space agencies, have a really very real plan to go to the moon, Mars, and beyond. So this is a snapshot of the NASA roadmap towards going to the moon, uh, or going to Mars with the moon as a test bed along the way, starting with Lunar Gateway and Artemis. So this is where I come in. So. We established that space is trying to kill us, but on top of that, space is expensive, space is hard, space is risky. So how do we retire that risk? And that comes from practicing in analogous environments that are in some way, some way space-like compared to Earth. So we call these analog environments. So I'm going to take the next couple minutes to tell you about my work in analog and extreme environments on Earth, starting with altered gravity environments. So how do we create partial and microgravity on Earth without going to space? So who here has heard of the Vomit Comet? Lots of you, yeah. So in parabolic flight, when we're flying in an airplane up and down, we can create periods of microgravity for 20 to 30 seconds at a time. We can perform some good science. We can augment the technology readiness level of things like 
spacesuits, um, which is what we're testing with the National Research Council there in that blue suit. Um, and we can also replicate altered gravity um, by creating harnesses that offload a certain amount of our weight. So this is with the Canadian Space Agency um, in 2019, and we managed to offload 99% of my weight in this scenario. So I'm simulating weightlessness, simulating um, fixing a panel outside the International Space Station in this case. How else um, do we replicate the space environment? Water analogs. So here is some work we did um, in Connecticut replicating a off-nominal spacesuit landing scenarios in the water. That's a fancy way of saying crash, crashing in, <laughs> into the water. Um, and so in this case, we're testing how does the spacesuit interface with water? How do you get into the raft quickly? Um, I learned the hard way. It's really important to pull the seals on your suit. Don't get water in it. It's hard. Uh, we also replicate neutral buoyancy labs. So NASA has one of these uh, six million gallons. We replicated our own mini version, and we basically built an airlock in a um, scenario in which we had to fix a module outside the International Space Station, replicating that neutral buoyancy. Um, there's a familiar flag. We also le learn a lot by working and living underwater. So this is the Neptune mission, 2019 Aquanaut mission. Uh, everything in exploration is an acronym. Neptune is nautical experiments in physiology, technology, and underwater exploration. We lived and worked underwater for five days um, performing technology demonstrations and physiology that would eventually help us in space. Not too far, far from the Jules Undersea Lodge is the Aquarius Reef Base. Both are in the Florida Keys. Um, this, this is actually a shout out to other two other EC50 members, um, was a training course we did with the World Extreme Medicine Organization. You'll hear more from Mark at the end of the day, um, where we learned um, more about dive and hyperbaric medicine. And NASA actually uses this lab to train its astronauts for six, eight to 16 days at a time. So we're down to 90 seconds here. So where do we go next? So Mars and lunar analogs. Uh, so we also learn a lot by going into Mars and moon-like environments. This is the Mars Desert Research Station um, in Utah Desert, real life on fake Mars. It's like life on Tatooine to suit up. To go outside, you have to suit up. Um, this is Cinder Lake in Arizona. This is where uh, we actually trained and performed planetary geology evolutions and experiments where the Apollo astronauts trained. Uh, and finally, we learn from operational and resource limited environments. So you don't have to be remote. You don't have to be in the middle of nowhere to simulate space. Um, you can do it through crew resource management in operational environments. This is a high altitude noctilucent flight in uh, northern Canada. And this is the operational space medicine course that I teach with the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. So basically, we're teaching our students to become a space medical MacGyver and deal with resource limited scenarios. So all of this is to say, to succeed on long duration, complex, faraway missions, we will need to science the space out of this. So in the last 20 seconds here today, I want to tell you quickly about three technology initiatives I am working on. Um, what technologies enable humans on long duration missions? So first of all, immersive technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, so this is a company I work with called Luxonic. We have built virtual reality learning modules for astronauts um, on long duration missions in tandem with the Canadian Space Agency. And what's really cool about that inlay is we actually tested one of our other technologies, virtual reality radiology. Um, on that Neptune underwater mission and connecting with the head of radiology 4,600 kilometers away in Saskatoon, Canada. Uh, also work with a company called Astrius. Um, so space, food is hard. It needs to have a long shelf life, be portable, be nutritious. So Astrius, I'm a medical advisor for that company. They work on um, providing lightweight, portable nutrition for anyone in an austere environment, not just astronauts. So any explorers want Astrius, hit me up. Uh, last but not least, okay, how do we get physics to work in our favor? We already established that gravity is not, lack of gravity is not our friend. So this is my work with Orbital Assembly Corporation. They plan to put the first partial gravity rotating space hotel in orbit by the end of the decade so we can actually bring some of that gravity back. So in the last second here, I'm going to say to you, a lot of this has application for some of our most remote and resource limited places on Earth. How do we bring those benefits back to Earth? We're already doing it today. Some of the VR work we're doing, we're already educating healthcare professionals along the world. So if any of this excites you, there's a whole host of problems in space medicine to be solved. And it all starts with a single step. So thank you so much for your time. Donna, that was uh, that's really quite spectacular.
another uh, person remotely connected to the missions into space issue. That's really incredible stuff that you're doing. I want to talk to you more about that later. So it's my pleasure to congratulate you, to award you this, and to welcome you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Oh. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is my first time to use these fancy toys, actually. Yeah. Um, okay. May, may I start now? Yeah. Okay. Let me see. It's not working. Ah, okay. The green one. Okay. Okay. My name is uh, Wilson Chen. Actually, uh, I'm from Hong Kong, and I'm a polar equation leader, as well as a, a glaciological scientist in both polar regions. And uh, actually, I come from Hong Kong. It's a subtropical region. A lot of people don't understand why a tropical boy end up in polar region. But uh, for me, life, my life mission is really want to reach the frontier of unknown. Do you think about what's meaning the, the frontier of unknown for you? For, for me, I, I really think that I really want to become a first person to reach the area that, to make the first mistake, uh, sorry, okay, uh, to make the first mistake or even ask the first question that no one has been asked before. And that's why I really pursued myself in the polar region, as well as to study the ice as a glaciologist and to, to read the landscape or read the story of the ice. And that's why um, today I will talk about a little bit my work in both polar region as well as beyond the Earth. And uh, oh, these are my homeland, actually, because uh, 10 years I spent both polar region at least half a year each year. And then uh, during Arctic season, I always I need to go this uh, several regions in Kamchatka, Alaska, Greenland. Actually, last week, I just come back from Banffin Island to do my first uh, glaciological uh, instrument over there. And then Antarctica season, it means uh, from uh, November until March, I need to go to South Pole sometime. I ski two times to South Pole, and then to rock in Ross, uh, Ross Sea and Red Sea to filming or some logistic uh, uh, work, as well as in Peninsula and Mount Vincent as well. And moreover, that I'm a member of uh, um, International Arctic Science Community, as well as a, a scientific community on Antarctica research. And uh, both is uh, planning each year uh, how we scientific uh, uh, contribution or discover both polar regions. Yeah, so we did plan ahead because the logistics and, and, and resources are quite limited. And this is my office, I can say, <laughs> yeah, with a. Uh, little bit colleagues from Penguin as well as Polar Bear. Uh, but by the way, uh, we did keep five meters with the, pool, uh, with the Penguin, but the Penguin don't know any regulation. So I, I try, try my best. I do my best to tell them that we did keep five, dis five meter distance, but <laughs> they, don't, they don't obey it. I'm sorry about this. But yes, and this is my office. And uh, each year, I spend at least half a year in this polar region to study ice as well as um, to, to, to help another scientific discovery. And then, uh, yeah, ski to South Pole, and then this uh, 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 Dirali uh, uh, in Alaska, the highest mountain in North America. Uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, after, I have 10 years experience in the both polar region, and that's why I want to convert my um, intensive uh, polar expedition skill into scientific discovery. That's why I go back to school. Actually, I study at St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg State University to study whole uh, 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 no, uh, Arctic uh, Ocean. And that's why I have a free uh, glaciological uh, uh, monitoring surface in Altai, in Russian Far East, no, in Siberia, sorry, in Siberia, as well as I just finished my work in Svalbard, and uh, there's an uh, ice cap melting, it's a uh, uh, great flooding for a cold mine. And so we need to investigate how they will last long and how can solve the problem over there. And uh, actually, this is this picture from last week from Banffin Island. Yeah, I just, just come here and present, and actually I go back again yeah, for my work. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm glad to see everybody in here. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, at Queen University, I work for Queen University as a, a researcher and to install the first uh, um, glaciological monitor surface over there. Because not that much people know that how they melt and how they impact the sea level rising. And we need to improve the uncertainty to, to face the situation in the future. And then uh, I, I want to share, I want to share my uh, little bit achievement because uh, uh, last week we tried to using manpower, not helicopter, not uh, uh, aircraft. We installed uh, three, uh, no, nine, lo uh, six locations over there 
to, to next year we'll go back and see how they melt and then which impact the uh, geohazard as well as the sea level rising. And a lot of people don't know where's the uh, Bumpin Island and in here actually nearby Greenland. And uh, this year, uh, uh, these four years, uh, in coming four years, I need to monitor these two ice caps. Uh, it's called uh, Penny Ice Cap as well as Bylot Island. So I constantly need to go there. And then not only study on the ice surface, we go under, inside, because we need to know the geo, no, sorry, the thermal dynamic as well as glacial dynamic inside. So they tell you a lot of story. And I always say that I really love my, my work is because as a glaciologist, we read the landscape, we read the ice. They tell you the story. They really tell you a lot of story if you pay attention and just like wearing glasses. And I'd love to share with you all later on, maybe not to, the, we have six minutes only. And every time uh, we go inside, just like galaxy, because all blue eyes is, is all Asian eyes is blue, it's amazing. And you sleep over there, just like time machine, time flight. And you, you feel connection with the, with the eyes and landscape as well. And then a lot of people uh, ask me, because uh, I take work in the field, it's a lot of risk. As well as um, the, um, the uh, sea level rising, as well as the melting, a lot of feel, people feel very depressed. And I always say, answer the question is, what is the dangers in the life? Because in this fast changing environment, especially the Arctic and Antarctic region, and I always say that stay safe is the most dangerous things. Yeah, because, because if you don't take a risk, you never change. Especially, ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, because uh, nowadays we need we need to make a decision, a good decision to change the life, change our our battle in both polar regions. And I really like this word. And uh, decision is uh, in German is called estado. It means that uh, the word or uh, 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 escape from familiar and escape from familiar. Yeah. So we need, we really need to make a good decision to escape what we are doing now, to take a risk, to make changing for our life, for next generation. Yeah, that's why uh, I have several projects, and uh, when we work in the uh, Arctic region, uh, we always work with uh, Inuit people, because they own land, as well as they have a no, uh, there's a lot of um, old knowledge, wisdom, that we don't know, because we're quite disconnected to nature. And we need to reconnect it to nature, to read the landscape, to read the eyes. Yeah, so we cooperation with, sorry, we partnership with our Inuit people. I hope we can reconnect again to the polar region. And the second thing is um, I set up some, uh, I set up uh, one organization in uh, Hong Kong actually. It's called Asian Youth Alpine Mentorship Program because we really need to educate more young generation to do polar exploration or scientific work in the polar region because uh, we, we're quite disconnected, and we need more scientific discovery in this region. Yeah, that's why I set up this program, and later on next month, uh, we go to apps, and they're training up their um, alpine skill in order to help them to go to the further, to the uh, space area, uh, sorry, to the um, polar region. And finally, <laughs> enjoy the bear in the moon. <laughs> now, I, I believe that my glaciological uh, study, you need a person to go to the moon, to read the ice. Because if you send a person that don't know anything about ice, it's difficult to discover about this region. And I believe that because uh, two years later, we'll send the first cargo to the moon and we'll set up the moon amended kind base camp. And we need the ice, we need the water to get fuel, to get oxygen, to get water. So uh, I, I really hope this is my little dream. I, I, I know it's quite challenging, but I'll do my best. That's why I'm here and everybody here. To challenge your life. <laughs> yeah, I, I just give you one more uh, take-home message. Life is challenged by the dream, by our dream, and exempted by the risk we are taking and the fail. Yeah. So uh, if you like, uh, there's an Instagram, and then you can follow me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit promotion. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, you are the first person who's, uh, who I, I need to put on a T-shirt. Um, the, the most dangerous thing is to stay safe. That is uh, the first Explorers Club motto. Thank you very much, and congratulations. I'm proud to present this to you.
observations. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. So I decided about 14 years ago to explore history through the bicycle. And I use the bicycle because it's a non-threatening vehicle to the environment. My goal is to curate routes throughout the U.S. that are historical. I travel every single state by bicycle except Alaska. That's my next one. In 2014 and 2020, I decided to travel through the Underground Railroad. I wanted to curate uh, a route of the Underground Railroad that is called, well, there's an old slave song that was called The Drinking Gourd. And The Drinking Gourd, Follow the Drinking Gourd, talks about and that's, it was actually a GPS that slaves used to navigate to freedom from the South. And they didn't know that, but they would sing to each other, and it was a way to, to navigate. And it pretty much says you follow the Tennessee River, Ohio River, into, and, and the North um, Star into Canada. So... I'm just going to show you some photos of some of my trips, especially this one and the project that I'm working on this year. Okay. Um, this is in Mobile, Alabama, outside a slave market, um, curating some of the routes. And my hope is that, again, future generations are able to learn history through, um, through the bicycle, traveling through a bicycle. Um, this is uh, the meaning of the lyrics of traveling, um, follow the drinking gourd. You could actually go to YouTube and um, look at that song as well. And um, pretty much, again, you, you, you navigate through the Tennessee River on the Ohio River. So that's what I did a lot and um, stayed in, in cabins uh, similar to um, – the previous explorers and the freedom seekers that were navigating to freedom. <laughs> oh, I don't go back to that one there. Okay. Yeah. So this is one of, uh, this is Ripley, Ohio, uh, the ranking house, um, a famous uh, underground railroad station. And that was one of my goals to stay at one of the underground railroad station. And this is one of them that I was able to spend the night um, and I really couldn't sleep because I knew the history of the Wrecking House and, and just the energy there. It was just amazing. But this is Ohio, and the other side is Kentucky. So it uh, sits right on the river bank of the Ohio River. Yep, traveling through the Underground Railroad. Uh, one of the – another uh, Underground Railroad station is in Ashtabula, Ohio. Um, and on the other side of Ashtabula – Literally behind this building is Lake Erie, and then you can see Canada from that area. So, and this is me um, sitting proudly by Niagara Falls. <laughs> After 1,900 miles of traveling by bicycle, again, I did it in 2014 and 2020. Um, but this is my next project, retracing the expedition of the Bicycle Corp. From Fort Missoula, Montana to St. Louis, Missouri, 1,900 miles took them 41 days, an all African-American troop. Um, a lot of people don't know about the history of them, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share. Um, uh, I'm going to be retracing that this year, uh, literally 125 years later. Uh, they started June 14 of 1897 at 5.40 in the morning, and I will be doing the same thing at 5.40 in the morning. I will be leaving Fort Missoula and riding my bicycle to St. Louis. Um, Took them 41 days. They had two days off, um, and they arrived in St. Louis at 
3 o'clock at Forested Park, and I will be doing the same thing, <laughs> arriving at St. Louis. And this is the actual map um, that I was able to gather from uh, the museum in Fort Missoula, which I'm going back next week to do more research. Um, so Montana, Wyoming, a little part of South Dakota, Nebraska, and Missouri. Yeah, got a little echo there. <laughs> but uh, the whole idea was to test the bicycle to see if they were able to use the bicycle as a method of transportation for war. They were using the horse at the time. And Lieutenant Moss, who we see right there proudly, um, he was about 26 years old, uh, graduate of West Point, and probably one of the last, um, he was probably the last in his class. And when you were last in his class and, and at West Point, you were sent out to work with African-American troops. Luckily for him, um, he made history. He was fascinated with the bicycle, actually obsessed with the bicycle, that uh, approached the Army and says, we should use the bicycle as a method of transportation. They agree. Um, and he said, I got the best men to do this. And they did. Three expeditions prior to the 1897. Uh, first, they rode 125 miles north to Lake McDonald, um, and then to Yellowstone, about 400 miles each way. Something I forgot to mention. Out of 20 uh, troopers, only four knew how to ride a bike. <laughs> so he had to do a lot of uh, uh, teaching to, to these guys. but. When 1897 came around, they were, they were really strong riders, um, navigated uh, routes that um, is hard to navigate. They, they didn't have uh, gear like we have today. They were single speed, so they had to carry and walk their bikes a lot. It was a very grueling um, expedition for them. They actually, it was a lot of mud, and every seven miles, they had to, like, get the mud out of the, the bicycles. Interesting thing that I found out from them, they, um, they called it gumbo. So the mud was called gumbo. Um, they, it was just, just, just a mess. And they just like uh, called it gumbo, and I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, many of you know this um, location is uh, Old Faithful. And um, an interesting thing, too, to me was that because I've been able to find some really cool pictures and a lot of newspaper articles, I actually have every single, okay, let me retrace that because there was a kid, and I call him a kid because he was 20 years old, but he was a student at University of Montana, also obsessed with the bicycle, and his dad was the editor of the newspaper, the Missoulin, and he told his dad, Dad, I want to go with those men on that expedition. And luckily, we have these amazing photos because Edward Booz, 20 years old, decided to travel with, um, with the 25th Infantry. And he also wrote uh, newspaper articles to the Missoulin and the San Louis newspaper every single day. Um, I literally have clips of all of them, 41 of them. So as I will be traveling, I'm able to connect the history that he wrote. And it's just, just I'm, I'm just, it's bracing my skin. I've been researching this for over 10 years since I learned about them. And, um, and yeah, now that it's 125 years anniversary, I, um, a friend of mine was like, what's your project this year? And I was like, I've been fascinated. And some people call it obsessed with this history. So I wanted to retrace it. He's like, let's do it. Let's i help you with whatever. I was like, whoa, I have to um, speak to my wife before I could even do that. I got married about two years ago, and uh, now, it's, uh, and I have a baby as well. So, um, But she, she immediately said, you have to do this to, um, to keep this history alive and for other people to travel and pay homage to, to these guys. But, yeah, uh, these are newspaper uh, paper articles from Edward Booth from 1897. One of my favorite pictures, I had to show it, um, this was in Livingston, Montana, and their, their face, I was like, man, they look so fresh. But that's why I was able to connect 
where it was taken because it was only like three or four days. Um, uh, they were really tired at the end of this trip, but, but I just love their face. And I love that um, everywhere they went, this was actually the story in 1897. This was the story. So everyone knew about it because they were following it on newspapers. So every time they walked somewhere or rode somewhere, you will see people around uh, gathering. Again, very grueling expedition. They, um, several times they had to get on the railroad just because the gumbo was so bad. Um, and, and they weren't able to ride. Plus, a lot, they had to go over the Rocky Mountains on single speed. Uh, that was really, really grueling. Someone said, oh, you should do single speed. I'm like, no. I couldn't, I couldn't do, as strong as a rider I am, I couldn't do what they did back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Probably one of, one of my favorite writers of this was Private John Finley. I connected with him. He was actually the mechanic. He was a mechanic in Chicago prior to enlisting um, to the Army. Why I became fascinated was because I think that without him, um, it would have been very difficult to complete the mission. <sighs> Lieutenant Moss was obsessed with, 50 miles every day. He wanted to ride 50 miles. The bikes that we have today are, I have an ex, several expedition bikes. Um, those were not expedition bikes. Those, um, the spokes were, um, couldn't handle it. The, 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 the rubber tires were 125 years. They didn't have that technology that we have today. But he kept it going. As a matter of fact, he wasn't able to sleep at night just working on all these bikes. And, 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 and that was a lot of pressure for him. But he um, completed those. Um, he would stay up all night fixing his bikes. Let me see what's the next page because, okay, I love this, it, this one. And I'm going to go back to the other one with John Finley, if I can. Uh, oh, there I go. Yep. So I got fascinated with them. And history always talks about them as the bicycle corpse. And I was like, ah, I want to know, I want to know who they were as individual. I knew everything about Lieutenant Moss, but history did not say a lot about them, uh, about the African American soldiers. So I did a lot of research. Now I was able to find every single name, where they were born, where they died, and everything in between. So I have every single writer. But again, I was fascinated with John Finley and several other ones. But they went up to the Spanish War. They were actually, the 25th Infantry was the first troop that was sent to Cuba. And this is where the story changes and why I want to do it, because to me it's about giving them dignity. Um, after the Spanish War, they were sent to Brownsville, Texas, where the residents of, of Brownsville, Texas, did not want black soldiers to live there. So they made it impossible for them to live there. Um, and there was an incident that happened. A bartender was hurt, a police officer was shot, and they blamed the 25th Infantry. And records indi indicate that they had nothing to do with them. As, as a matter of fact, their superiors told them they were in the barracks, that they were not in the town. And they were cleared by the court, the Texas court, and they were cleared. But it escalated politically, and it went all the way up to the president of that era, which is actually a member of the club, and, and, and I adore him, but um, it's probably, history says it was probably the worst mistake um, an American president has ever done. He, without research, um, discernible discharged the whole platoon. John Finley and many others were left without pension. There was one guy, Lieutenant, I don't know, Sergeant Mingo Sander, who was 38 years old in that expedition. At the time he was dishonorable discharge, he was about three months to retiring, left without a pension. Most of these guys forgotten. I'll show you this plaque because last week there's several of them that, um,
Several of them were buried without the tombstone. And um, one of my mission is to give them dignity. Last week, with the help of the VA and many historians, we got John Finley a plaque to give him dignity. It's just, yeah. Now, and we're working with many others because they deserve it. They deserve it. Um, but anyways, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Let me clear my eyes. That's all right. You know, this seems to be a recurring theme that, you know, history keeps getting examined. And, you know, the further you dig, you realize how many people were involved, never recognized. And I think, you know, um, J.R. Harris, I don't know if he's here right now, he always says, look, let's, you know, look at the um, uh, back history. But he said, let's move forward. Let's make sure that this kind of stuff moving forward doesn't happen. It's incumbent on us as all explorers. And Eric, thank you so much for that. I mean, thank honestly, it's, it, it was, it's really, um, you know, heartwarming to hear this kind of stuff. And, and congratulations on an EZ-50. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've been talking a lot about imposter syndrome. <laughs> I am not an EC50, so I am the biggest imposter here. So I feel the pressure. I'm a member of the Explorers Club, and uh, for the last two years uh, with the EC50, I've had the honor of nominating some of the people that I work with in China. I'm a filmmaker and conservation photographer in China, and I work with the rangers and the conservationists who are working out in the field to protect China's last wilderness areas and wildlife. Um, so actually, Yu Jiahua, who is a five, um, he's a ranger. I'm going to show a short five-minute film about him today, which won uh, this year's first place in the Chinese National Geographic short film competition for nature. Um, but also uh, Liu Yanlin, who also won this year. And Liu Yanlin, I'd also like to point out his work as an EC50 from 2021. He studied under George Saller, um, and, and now he works to build, really lead the first conservation efforts in the new Tilian Mountains National Park and Snow for Protection in China. So both of these individuals are just incredible. And their work in China, um, while they're quite well known in China now, often the outside world because of language or internet, and of course they can't travel here um, from restrictions, um, they don't get the word out a lot. So all credit goes to Yu Jiahua and Liu Yanlin. And this film about Yu Jiahua, who is a 72-year-old grandfather, as he told me in a short story, um, they once had to overcome poachers with guns with their bare hands because as poachers in China, they can't ha have guns and guns are illegal. Um, so he's one of the most incredible, brave people I know. And this is a short five minute film. Hopefully the audio works and we can all enjoy it. Thank you. It's really nice background music right now. <laughs> So this was filmed in the new Giant Panther National Park, um, and this is all about over 14,000 feet uh, within the National Park. And this area in the 70s and 80s 
um, poachers basically they used to burn the forest to kind of scare out the animals, and they would send some people below on the mountains to burn the forest, and others with guns to hunt the animals. And that's when Yu Jiahua basically turned from poacher to protector in the 80s to start this conservation group. I would, that is, we got like two seconds of it. <laughs> oh, it's me. Oh, my gosh. Gosh, what incredible company to be amongst. I'm just sitting there just in awe of everyone. I can't believe I'm here. I really can't believe I'm here. Gosh, so when I was going through a particularly difficult time in my life, I was depressed. I was lost. I sent out a sincere prayer. I was on my knees in complete surrender, and I asked the universe, Please show me how I can be of best use to the world. And I know we've all been there because every single one of you in this room wants to make a positive difference in the world. And this then sparked a really pivotal and humbling decade of my life in conservation. So as a conservation geneticist, I've always been deeply fascinated by the use of genetic tools, not just to learn more about rare and elusive species, the rare, rare and elusive species that survive in the planet's extremes. When I was a kid, I was deeply inspired by my great-grandfather, Charlie Sandell, who was part of Mawson's Antarctic expedition from 1911 to 1914. And I was lucky enough to follow in his footsteps. <laughs> First, uh, with a PhD with the Australian Antarctic Division on humpback whales, and then, after that, I got to study the largest animal that's ever existed, the Antarctic blue whale. And this was an incredible dream come true for me. Now, trying to find an Antarctic blue whale in the vast southern ocean is pretty much like trying to find a needle in an ocean full of haystacks. <laughs> but luckily, they vocalise really loudly and at very low frequencies, so we can detect them from over a thousand kilometres away. So to find one, our acousticians would drop sonoboys over the side of the ship, which are basically like floating microphone arrays. So when you detect a blue whale call, 
from three of these sonovoids, they can then triangulate those those positions and place the ship within two nautical miles of that individual that was calling from over a thousand kilometres away, which is phenomenal and we can easily see their tall glows on the horizon. And we managed to make some pretty cool discoveries um, with this work. So when we were trialling this method off the southeast east coast of Australia, we literally bumped into the, one of the rarest wild species in the world. This species is so rare that it's only previously been described from dead specimens and we managed to get both photos and video footage, shepherd's beach whale. When we were in the Ross Sea, uh, around the sea ice, we encountered a massive feeding aggregation of over 100 Antarctic blue whales, gorging themselves on big balls of krill. It was the most phenomenal thing I think I've ever witnessed in my life. And we were the first team of people to satellite tag an Antarctic blue whale to track their movement. And for that, we had to get up very, very close. And this is a clip of this exact moment. Please let it work. I'm doing the lead bar. There you go. And okay. play. They're going to play. Oh. Go back. Oh. Okay, they're going to press play. Okay. Okay. Come on, the moment. This <laughs> is the moment. Oh, was it not going to play? Cannot play media. Oh, my God. That's okay. I mean, it's literally 30 seconds, so... No, no, no. We're inspired. Okay. We see that full clip. You, I'll let you finish the rest, but we will come back to that clip. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me... So this clip was literally the culmination of everything that we'd worked so hard for. Like, it was months and years of work in this moment. We were both... Uh, excited and absolutely petrified because so much can go wrong in that moment. Um, we, we had to get the biopsy sample, the tag and the photograph all at the same time or we missed the, the opportunity completely. Um, we're racing towards this whale, we have to accelerate, our hearts are racing at the same time and we, and we managed to get the tag. But what I wanted to say about this it, was that it, it was the times that I was in that little boat and in amongst the sea ice, and it was dead calm, dead quiet, and a sea fog would come in, and the ship would disappear. And so you were completely alone in the middle of the Southern Ocean. They were the moments that I was in complete awe, where you're so completely connected to all of nature. I cried many times. <laughs> and in those moments, I thought to myself, my God, Everyone needs to experience this feeling, not just an elite few such as myself. I, a change began to occur in me, a transformation. I was still interested in rare and elusive species, but I thought, really, to be truly successful in conservation, we need to involve everyday people. And everyday people need to experience this type of awe along with us. And that transformation was so profound that I actually gave up whale research, or well, postponed it at least. And I started working for an NGO called Panji um, in, with communities in the high Himalaya of Nepal around snow leopard conservation. And it was these animals and these incredible people that ma made me realise there's a gap in conservation that needs filling. And I've spent the last six years trying to fill that gap by trying to develop a species detection technology that can be used by everyday people. And I wanted to end this talk by saying that I'm 
very grateful and lucky to have been able to follow my heart in conservation, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but I truly believe that when we let go of what we think we are, we become what we might be, and that is someone that is potentially more useful for the world. And I really look forward to talking to you more about this technology that I've been developing over the past six years in a future talk. But until then, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, you're a lot more philosophical than I am, so I'm going to let you take this. <laughs> oh. I, no, it's an honor to um, present this to you, Natalie, and uh, both the parts of the world that you work in, the transformation that you've undergone yourself, the exploration of yourself and of the world, and the messaging out to the world is so profound, and I'm just very proud uh, to be able to present this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys. And we will see that clip. Yes. You know, you just missed a very good uh, Explorers Club moment, and this happens all the time when you put people together. Because I want to talk to you about some of the Snow Leopard work I did, and that happens time and time again when you put uh, people together. So, um, just wanted to share yet another Explorers Club moment. So, Natalie, we will see that clip yes. a little later. Hi, um, I'm Theo Agnostopoulos. I'm from Greece. I'm delighted to be here. Um, <clears throat> many years ago, when I was studying for my PhD uh, in, in England uh, in molecular genetics, towards the end of it, somebody I went to a party um, and and um, somebody asked me, "Hey, Theo, uh, what is your work about?" I said, "It's easy. Uh, I'm studying the DNA variation on human XQ22." And, and they didn't ask anything else. They, they, <laughs> they, they left. Um, and, and then I, I kind of uh, realized that perhaps I hadn't delivered so well um, what exactly I was doing. <clears throat> and perhaps some other fellow scientists um, aren't delivering their work so well either. And it made me think a little bit about science and society and the gap uh, that is all around it. And perhaps that was a fascinating area to work on. So... Um, um, after doing several things, I went through a second pu uh, puberty trying to find out what I wanted to do. I uh, even um, did a, a green uh, road trip from Athens to Beijing, filming renewable energy sources along the Silk Road. I ended up uh, deciding that I would like to engage in science communication, so I founded a non-profit organization called PSYCHO uh, for science communication <laughs> with the aim... Yeah, I know. Um, uh, uh, the aim of making science simple. Now, for many years, um, for many years, I had to come up with all sort of uh, f foolish um, answers to why it's important to communicate science, such as um, talking about the Flat Earth Society. Um, I, I actually, um, I, I checked these tickets for this year, if anybody is interested. Um, uh, and then, until, um, until uh, March 2020, when the COVID pandemic hit, and as you probably have realized, um, that was a turning point for all of us in the public understanding of science. Scientists became superheroes. New York Times in April 2020 says that the scientists are the new superheroes because everybody turned to scientists to find out about answers. That was a pivotal moment for all of our work. So <clears throat> what do we do? Well, we basically um, operate on two pillars. One is awareness. And the second one is empowerment. These are some of the logos of the 200 or more projects we've run over the last 13 years. I've selected two or three of them to, to talk to you about in order to show you a little bit of creativity in science engagement. So with regards to awareness, one of the things that we're doing is pretty common, actually. Um, we're running a series of science fairs around Greece and several other places around, around the world. Um, and here you see... Um, some of the areas in, in Greece that we're running them. But the most important thing that I would like to make out of this, when it comes to evaluate who goes to these fairs, who goes to science museums, 
who attends the Explorers Club talks? People who are already scientifically friendly. <laughs> so basically, if we were to target the anti-vacciners or the anti-climate changers, we are actually preaching to the converted. We're preaching to a different target group. So what do we need to do in order to target the general public, the ones who don't? Well, we've, we've come up with it. I'll show you two projects that we came up with. We call it um, guerrilla science. So um, basically, we, we're meet, meeting people uh, where they actually are. And this is Mind the Lab, one of our projects. We're running metro stations. It's named after Mind the Gap from London Underground. Um, we're running in different cities, in, in ports, in bus stops, in airports. Uh, so basically, in three minutes that the people will engage with you, you have some time to give a teaser about your work. You, not, this is not going to change the world, but it, w it might lead some people to follow up on this. Okay? A second me method on guerrilla science is what we have, this show we have called Celebrity Science. We're using the power of social media influencers here you see a YouTuber on the left, um, an astronaut, Clay Anderson from NASA, who is a scientist, and we're playing a game like Trivial Pursuit, watched by a live audience and on YouTube, and why it's so successful. If you see those videos in our channel, they have hundreds of thousands of views. It's successful because it's all comedy, and comedy is the most serious form of communication. Now, with regards to empowerment, the second pillar I mentioned, we mainly work on several different projects on STEM education um, in order to train the trainers. Who are the trainers? The trainers are science teachers, basically, but they're not STEM educators. It might seem a little bit common sense that a science teacher in the States is also a STEM educator, but they aren't around the world. They don't necessarily know how to connect real life um, science to what they, they put on the blackboard. And they're not doing it in a biomatic way, and they don't cultivate problem solving. This is what we're trying to do. We actually train the trainers, especially in remote areas. This is several remote areas all around Greece and Albania and in Cyprus. So um, these are less privileged areas. And what these teachers do after having been trained is they work with the youth, the pupils, and they try to turn them into social innovators via technology. So they develop projects that um, give answers to real social challenges. For example, the kid on the right top, he's made those uh, Googles for his blind grandmother. He's put some sensors on, and they can detect any obstacles up to the level of the knee. The um, drone that you see is made by another team of, of uh, teenagers in the island, remote island of Kalinos, and it's a pharmacy drone. So they, they've also made an application that the local citizens can actually call the drone and it will, it will bring them medicine. These uh, projects, they're not going to change the goal either, but they, and they're not prototypes for a startup either, but they do cultivate local community work, problem solving, collaboration spirit, and this is going to change the world. So we're using STEM um, workshops to, to upskill people, to combat um, sexual inequality by targeting kindergarten girls, because this is where perceptions start, that the girls play with dolls and the boys play with uh, um, guns or, or whatever trains, okay? So we target their do STEM in the kindergartens, or we use them to bridge isolated populations. And this is my last example here. Um, so this is in collaboration with National Geographic. This is a very remote area in the northeastern Greece. There's a population there that are called the Pomaks. The Pomaks, these are the villages in the, in the mountainous area. And um, basically they, are, they have their own language. They're of, of Slavic origin, however Greek. They are Muslim, and they're culturally and geographically isolated. As a result, they do all sort of nasty jobs, um, going to, w to work in shipyards when they finish school. They don't even finish school. So what did we try to do? This project is actually running. It's ongoing as we speak. 
we went there and we tried to bridge those kids with the kids from the cities. And so basically we're using science as a bridge for cultural integration. And imagine this, we have plans to run it in Rwanda, in, in, a, in a Cyprus, in the divided area, and in all kind of areas that is either form a war area or there's some kind of uh, isolation or uh, separation. So I would like to close by, with this game. Um, this is based from a study done in 1968 um, for many years in the same population. And I would like to ask you, how many different uses of a paperclip can a five-year-old child find? <laughs> it's pretty close. 90, 80% of the kids do about 145. <laughs> they, they can use it for a, for a button or as a shoulder or as a toy, many, many things. How about a 10-year-old? About 70. And how about adults? <laughs> about one, yes. <laughs> Not even one. Um, so what does this show us? It shows us that creativity goes down as we, uh, as we grow older. And, and why is this happening? Um, I, I call it the social software that we put into the kids and uh, we, we say, oh, don't do this. Uh, no, don't do that. It will fail. Or, um, you know, you should do it this way. So basically, by, by the time you're an adult, there's basically, you're afraid to try everything. Um, everybody is born a scientist. Everybody's born an explorer. The toddlers use all of their senses to explore things. Can we try and keep it this way? Thank you so much. As a former teacher, I want to uh, present this to you on my knees. Um, so, so, thank you very much and welcome. The work you're doing is so important and, and so impactful. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if anybody's looking for gifts for five or six year olds, you know, paper clips, paper clips. All right, thank you. All right, happy Earth Day, everybody. I am Brett. Super excited to spend a few minutes talking with you today about what we're doing at Howell Conservation Fund. We solve at the root cause of conservation issues. Green. And we're adapting as explorers do. Nope, this is completely the wrong setup. All right, we'll get the text solved. In 2019, we were fortunate to lead an expedition to the world's most plastic polluted beach. These are a few photos of that. Now you might think if you just got back from spring break, we were cleaning up Miami Beach. <laughs> but in fact, we were on one of the world's most remote islands. It's called Henderson Island. It's controlled by the British Overseas Territory. You ever heard of the HMS Bounty? It goes back to the days of Pitcairn Island and your closest reference points are New Zealand and South America. In fact, it is so remote, and it's ironic I'm standing here at the Explorers Club, that the Brits just figured out a couple months ago they had the island on the wrong place on the map for 85 years. <laughs> Might explain, while we were on the expedition ship, various software packages kept thinking we were driving through the island, but we were actually floating. So how does a mile and a half beach on an uninhabited World Heritage Site end up looking like this. 
And unfortunately, it's a tale of us, especially on Earth Day, it's relevant. No matter your best intention, if you're throwing out a piece of garbage, even if you're trying to recycle it, if it ends up on the street, if it washes down a storm drain, there's a very high likelihood it's getting into an ocean current and ending up somewhere like Henderson Island. So a few wow stats. It is estimated that the mass equivalent of 5,000 to 125,000 blue whales is entering the ocean each year in the form of plastic. 80% of this is now known to come from land. It used to be thought this was ship-based, for example. And 5.25 trillion pieces are estimated to be out there. So what does 5.25 trillion even look like? That's a big, big number. So if you take U.S. dollars, put the average size human next to it, a million's a little bit, a hundred million's more, a billion is great, and one trillion is an Amazon warehouse. And we're talking 5.25 times that floating around. In 2019, as I mentioned, we led this expedition, and almost from minute one, disaster struck. A rigid hull inflatable boat, bottom right here, flipped as our media team was going in. And we had overnight castaways completely unexpected, right? We do, what we do as explorers, you pivot. We were safely able to get the team off and we created a new trail. We went around ocean headlands, we scaled through a forest, we scaled a cliff. It was amazing, each day we did a 10K a day to get to the project site. The Explorers Club doesn't give out flags easily. We were happy to carry flag 97 on this expedition, and in the end, we hit every single work stream we set out to. We discovered new plastic pollution science. We cleaned up the beach, all of it, down to bottle cap size. We established new scuba records from marine protected areas. We also had a plastic pollution artist with us. That also helped put Howell Conservation Fund on the map. As part of the global media, they were able to tell the story of pollution and how we as humans can do differently. The New York Times profiled Howell Conservation Fund and our work on solving root cause conservation issues. Our mantra is all about collaboration. How do we catalyze teams to scale breakthrough solutions? A couple examples of what we are doing end to end with the vision that someday we could go back to a Henderson and never see plastic pollution like this again. You may have seen the past couple of months headlines out of Nairobi with the United Nations that we are finally going to have a plastic pollution treaty. This will simplify the entire process so that we can solve these problems. Working with the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network, we are a member of activist to industry as it's so called, where you're for the first time you're having groups like Greenpeace talking to the likes of Coca-Cola and Dow Chemical about how all these groups can do better together. We also work with startups, such as the Center for Regenerative Design and Collaboration. Their technology takes plastic, no matter how trashed it is, from Henderson Island and creates it into a viable new alternative that also solves the housing crisis. We are also working with the United Nations Development Program in Samoa with CRDC to see if we can make that island plastic pollution free. We also work hyper-locally, project up in New Hampshire, funded by ourselves, the National Oceanic, Ac National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, mouthful NOAA, and New Hampshire Sea Grant. And in this case, they had 10 years worth of plastic pollution data. They didn't have the capacity to analyze it. We brought in an analyst. We're looking if there's any scientific themes there. And more importantly, we are trying to create a replicable model so that a nonprofit can figure out who the top polluter is in an area and then scale that approach so that we can all communicate more effectively with the environment around us. This is one of my favorite photos from Henderson Island. Half of what we collected was from the fishing industry. We started each morning with the Henderson Island workout clearing that fishing industry material. And that has certainly led personal behavior change in how I live my life. I would leave you with, especially on Earth Day today, don't be afraid to take that first step. If you have an idea that you think can change the world, no matter if it's in conservation or space or whatever it is, reach out. We're at the Explorers Club. Make that connection because you never know when your idea is going to be the next one that changes the world. Thank you, everybody. You know, the motto of uh, 
our thing is 50 people who are changing the world. And, Brett, you know, you epitomize that. And, you know, thank goodness we found you. Happy Earth Day and congratulations. Thank you so much. First colleague, it's a pleasure to have in front of me such an uh, interested audience. My name is uh, Ignacio Fitzgerald. I, I earned my life exploring the wind all over the all over the world, and in my spare time, among other vices, I, I practice polar exploration, I'm trying to to change the way we do things in in this environment. Today, I'm going to to talk uh, about a project uh, in which I am involved, one of the projects in which I am involved, uh, that is called the Polar Wind Highways. This is a project that was um, created by Ramon Larramendi, who is my mentor within the exploration, polar exploration world, and also my EC50 sponsor. So thank you, Ramon. He is not today with us because he's starting an expedition in, in Greenland. Uh, well, and I, I got a question for you. Uh, do you know that it's already possible to navigate on the ice for thousands of kilometers across the most inaccessible, inhospitable, and unknown regions of the world in some kind of ship without using any fuel? In order to do so, we need three main ingredients. We need the unknown regions, we need the power to move, and we need the, the vehicle to do it. Well, regarding the unknown regions, some of the most unknown, uh, unknown regions of, of the world are the huge ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. Today we are going to focus in, in Antarctica. Most of the human activity in Antarctica takes place in the island and, and shores of the northernmost corner of the Antarctic Peninsula, which is actually well off the Antarctic cycle. Whereas, most, whereas the, the interior of the continent, which is uh, called the Easter Plateau, the eastern ice sheet of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Antarctica, which is 1.5 times the size of uh, mainland USA, and around 7.5 times the, the, the land surface of the Earth, is mostly unknown and pristine, which is all this area in the, in the blue cycle. And well, and uh, this, is, this was the territory, the unknown territory. Talking about the power, uh, our work is, is showing that the power that we need to move is, uh, is there, that is in Antarctica or in Greenland, that we don't need to import it, that it's, it is in the form of wind. And based on our models, we have first sketch what we call the, the wind highways. And these wind highways are like the main channels of the wind, and they allow you to go across and around most of the continent. And secondly, we have outlined what we call the secondary wind roads, which uh, will help you to, to explore and to connect other relevant places of the continent, but this time the conditions of the surface of the ice and the conditions of the wind are not so favorable. Well, and now let's talk about vehicle. Uh, today's alternatives uh, to move in, in, this, in these places are expensive, and are and environmentally are um, arguable. Yeah, are, so, but we have, a, we have a solution. We have been working for, for around uh, more than 20 years in a solution. It's the Winners Lead. The Winners Lead is a, an ingenious invention created by, by Ramon Larramendi. And this is a, a, it is a, an sled which is made of pieces of wood joined together with the little pieces of rope in the way that, uh, because uh, Ramon has got experience with the Inuit culture, so it's based on, on this culture. And then you put a, a tent on the top of it, and then a kite, which is steered manually with a pulley system, and, um, and is attached to the runners of the, of the sled. And well, and, and this kite, you can place it up to 250 meters above ground level, and it's got a size of uh, from 5 up to 250 square meters. And, well, and we have been 
validated our model in, in Greenland and in Antarctica. I'm going to talk about the validations in Antarctica because it's like the, the tip of the iceberg in, in our project. And we have done it in three main expeditions. This one in orange here, that was an expedition in 2005-06 in which we crossed Antarctica across the inaccessibility area. It was a, an expedition of five, uh, around 5,000 kilometers and we reached for the first time the inaccessibility South Pole. Then in, in 2011-12, another crossing of Antarctica, this time with a stop in the geographic South Pole. And finally, in 2018-19, we made a round trip around Don Fuji, that, the, that one at the top there, which is the area that is the origin of the wind. Uh, so it's, it's the most difficult to, to go around because actually this, the, the model says that the, the wind is almost, it's, it's not there. And also one is uh, the coldest area uh, on Earth. And well, and, uh, I don't know what but, but we just left. Scientific uh, work for many different for many different scientific uh, organizations as well as my uh, as well as well uh, for our regions you know I, are more important than ever uh, we are still just to have the opportunity. Um, yeah, we still have the opportunity of um, of studying the past without discovering it. And my 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 desired legacy, my my strongest motivation is to make other explorers to see these invisible highways uh, powered by these invisible fields uh, that make Antarctica and Greenland happy to to receive us, to to unveil their secrets. And well, and later in in 2023. Uh, will, uh, we will become, Winneslet will become the first uh, sustainable, mobile, international, scientific base in, in Antarctica, uh, hopefully under the, the auspice of the Spanish Polar Committee. Mm? And well, and take a quote and, and join us to change the way we explore our world. That is extraordinary design and problem solving, I have to say, as a designer myself. I'm very proud uh, to present this to you, Ignacio. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you for, uh, for that work. Congratulations. Very innovative. Very innovative. Yeah, thank you. Green. Okay, green. Okay. Oh, okay. Tough acts to follow. My goodness, what am I going to do? So well, let's go. Anishinaabe, Eshigewin. Okay, this is a bit of a difficult word, so I'll explain. Okay, back during the pandemic, I'm sure everyone was going, what am I doing? Well, everyone was surfing and Googling and trying to work out, and in including Sleuth, who are you? What are you doing? What are you up to? So this is what happened to me. Well, actually, I'm an archaeologist and there's no historian. Well, I was doing the same, like I'm sure everyone else was doing. You know, oh, someone's interesting. Let's go and have a look at them. Well, what happened to me, um, I have an Academia EDU account, like everybody who does articles. We all do. Shove them up there. Anyway, I had this article. Couldn't get it published. Everyone knew. The usual problem. Everyone says, oh, I don't like it. Reviews hate it. So you're like, oh, finally. And I finally published it, and then it got stuck because of COVID. And I'm like, no, can't believe it. So anyway, shoved it up on academia.edu, finally, when it kindly came around, saying relief. Then I got this guy who kept following me. And I was like, who are you, weirdo? Anyway, it's called this giant guy called George Kenny, because he sent me an email saying, hi, I'm actually a dynastic shaman, and I'm really sick of academics because you keep telling us what we think, even though you come up and visit us. So I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I don't know how to reply to that one. 
so he says, well, I've actually chosen you. I was like, ah, uh, um, because you're Bruce Trigger's student. And I'm like, oh, didn't know how to respond to that one. So he's like, I'm going to tell you, since we're now in COVID times, all about Anishinaabe Eshigewin, which is our view, the inside view. Because he said, we're sick. I'm tired of you lot as an outsider telling us how to think. So here goes, a bit quick, sorry about that. I had to tell you the backstory, it's pretty cool. Oh, come on. Do I do this here? I can't do this. Oh, agree. Okay, so introduction, Laksu. Laksu is actually got the most power, is known if you read the outsider literature. Now I'm gonna talk outsider and insider, so you're gonna have to get to grips with that. So I'm now an insider view. So all you lot are outsider. Okay, you'll know if you read the academic literature that it is in Northern Ontario. So it's three and a half hours driving time of Thunder Bay, which is in the North Shore of Lake Superior. So you're in Canada, just. You just left the USA. So um, I'm English, you can hear that. And um, so what is it they do there? This is Northern Ontario, which, so it's a sort of place where you go fishing. You know, if you're seriously into fishing, that's where you go. However, this is their view. This is from the, an expedition in 1919. He took loads of photographs. They said, we didn't like him. Well, he died, and they're like, not surprised. Because he took loads of stuff, and he put it in, in the museum. It's ours. So, they, you know, this is very, they considered it very powerful. These shamans considered the most powerful. They don't like the word shaman. They're called medicine people, medicine men and medicine women. They were notorious and always sort of doing things that got up the nose of the RCMP, if I'm used British slang here. Okay, so here we are, Laxall First Nation. So, so the OG Cree, now George, I'm going to call him George, Kenny, he's called George. Um, he is 70 and he usually tells me what he thinks of me, not much. And uh, so, he's got, he, he, so he speaks OG Cree, he speaks in English to me, thank goodness, because OG Cree is really hard. And he said, fights are fierce, they came here. They're a mixture of Oji Cree, so it tells you how. So I hope you know where we are. I put a big arrow. So that's the linguistic languages. This is the linguistic. This is how he explains it. So, but remember, he speaks to me in English. So, okay. Now, this is where it is. Now, there's legal differences, which I'm sure you understand. It's all about traditional territories and lands. It's everything in the red, okay? So remember that. Now, he wants us to go there. He says, you're coming to visit. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So he wants us to come and visit in the summer. And then he wants us to come with some lax, because he says, down the Severn River. Because we ha he wants to show us where the pictograph sites are. So I'm now going to not use the word pictograph, and I'm not going to use the word art either, because it's not. I'll explain why. OK, there it is, another one, just so you know where it is. We're further down there, New York, you can see us. Okay, this is what it looks like from the insider point of view. From the outsider point of view, we would call it empty. It's not. It's chock-a-block full of people. So this is the history, sort of combined, brief history. So Anishinaabe and Laxall, that's the place we are. Then they arrived uh, 6,000 years ago, 6 millennia. Then it appears on Peter Pond. You must know him. We're in the Explorers Club, pretty famous guy. Then we you know they had arguments with the Dakota, and that's why there's some Sioux there. So he'll talk about it. It's like, yeah, we had a bust up. And I'm like, yeah, but that's the 19th century. And he's like, no, no, bust up. Okay. So anyhow, his is what George is, this is his great grandpa. So he talks about him as if it was yesterday. So I have to try and remember the time is totally differently. And then through this whole time, he's taking the mickey out of me. My curly hair, it shows disrespect, should be flat. I just say, I can't help it, George. <laughs> and then, it, so you have all the people, and this is, this is the painting up, up the top. Now, he calls it gallery in the wilderness, but it's not really. This is a pun. Okay, so we're really talking about the inside and the outsider. Everyone in this room, you're outsiders. Uh, he's telling me about insiders, the Anishinaabeg. So this is a separation between the physical and non-physical world, which is you can move between the two dreams and visions. So we have traveling and the stationary soul. So we're talking about the different souls that are moving around. So essentially, we've got all these things. So it's talking about, uh, uh, we've got to realize, if we're going to understand something, we have to put the outside of you, the other side of the room, away, and adopt this side of you. 
So you have to sort of say all your preconceptions, all the other stuff you've read in the journals, all that academic stuff out the window, which is a bit nerve-wracking, actually. So what is it we're talking about? We're talking about soul, ghosts, and we're talking about religion, which is, you know, we're always told don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. Well, I have to. So it's all about being alive and things that are alive and accepting that my, I might think a rock is dead. It's not. It's paint. It's not. It's alive. So he's told me about what's in the paint, when they paint, what it's there, why it's there, why. Because his father was the, the, the shaman apprentice who was around at the time of Canada, Canada's father of rock art, which is really important. And he keeps on saying, but Dudeney didn't ask the shaman who was drumming around the corner who could have told him what they're about. Why? Because this is George's phrases, didn't ask the goddamn Indian. So, we've got to remember, this is not art. This is, there's no hierarchy. So, this is not else all. It's all, these are Eurocentric. This art stuff, we like to carry on, occurs in that space between the two worlds, when the physical and the non-physical. So what he wants us to do, we'll work with the shaman, go up there, have an experience of shaking tent, which sounds kind of frightening, actually. But it's to understand that when we think about things, we can't organize it in the way we may want to organize it. So you have to abandon everything you think you know and put it to one side and say, OK, and thinking, I must be at least five again. No, I'm not. But so it's a tough one. So where are we going with this? So. We're going to go up to Laxall and have a chat and discover everything and realizing that the way we organize our world as outsiders is problematic. If we're going to talk to people who are insiders who know how to understand the world, if we are going to solve things like climate crisis, all these other problems because we've made a mistake and we just have to say, okay, now let's see how you organize things. Okay, thank you very much. That was fantastic and fantastically fast, uh, and I can't wait to talk to you about it more. Congratulations and welcome. Yeah, I mean, you know, this seems to be a recurring theme that people communicate differently, and in order to approach the world's problems, you know, it's not going to come from one corner of the world. It's going to come from many voices and many views, and thank you for, thank you. for really having the grace to, to take this uh, subject on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is a terrifying company to be in, so... Um, uh, I really appreciate every one of the other talks uh, so far. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, as, as the world warms from climate change, plants at the highest elevations face three threats. So first, they face the direct effects of climate change, changes in temperature and precipitation. Uh, second, they face increasing competition from lower elevation plants that are now able to survive up in the alpine zone and may outcompete them. And third, they face changes from the climate-associated shifts in the way that we humans use their environment. And this is especially important to, uh, to us um, looking at the Himalaya, because the Himalaya is one of the areas with the very highest elevations where we see uh, um, plants, but also a unique and endemic uh, flora, and a flora that's very intensively used by local and indigenous peoples. So in the Himalayas, uh, the alpine flora is very important as uh, alpine pasture for yaks and cows and yak-cow hybrids. It's important as a place to gather medicinal plants, and that's long been a source of both health and livelihoods for Himalayan peoples. And it's a sacred space, which means that changes to the alpine zone in the Himalaya, they aren't just material, they're also spiritual or even cosmological. So to try to get at this, my colleagues and I joined a network called Gloria, which is a shared methodology used by mountain researchers around the world. 
And we're working in three uh, um, countries in the eastern Himalaya, so just a little east of some of the other speakers we've heard about in Nepal, Bhutan, and China. Um, so the network comprises PIs in each of the four countries. Uh, it also comprises professionals, botanic garden workers, and others in each of the countries, uh, graduate students, which incidentally is how I began, and the local and indigenous peoples whose villages surround the field sites we work at. At each of these sites, we uh, um, work across a variety of elevations from tree line, which in our areas is around 4,000 meters, up to the limit of plant life, which here is around 5,000 meters or 16,000 feet. So uh, these aren't established field stations. There are no Swiss chalets up here. We're usually on smaller airplanes once we're in country, uh, then pretty bumpy roads, moving to yak back or mountain ponies to carry our luggage and doing lots of trekking on foot, of course. Uh, at any one of these field sites, we conduct really detailed counts of the plants that are there. We install temperature monitors, and then we leave for seven to 10 years. Uh, and then we try to come back to gather the longitudinal data, the data over time, that lets us really tell the story of how climate change is affecting these unique and special places. So um, relocating the sites after seven to 10 years, even with GPS, even with permanent markers driven into the ground isn't easy. This can be a bit of a treasure hunt. And of course, working in these areas, um, I feel bad saying it after the talks we've seen, but isn't easy. It's not the easiest conditions to do. But as a reward for that, we get to see this incredible, unique flora, um, specially adapted to these harsh conditions in which they've evolved. Uh, we also see a, a large number of endemic plants. So these are plants that are only found in this area, which makes them especially a priority for conservation. So the Gloria method is designed to, to track how plants respond to climate change. And what we add to this is ethnobotany, looking at how people who rely on these plants are responding to the changes. So uh, this is Yegye Panero, one of the Nepali graduate students who works with us, conducting interviews on the tamang medicinal use for one of the plants, doing ethnobotany, as he prepares to um, make a pressed specimen, sort of standard classical collections botany, um, at the same time. So um, we're in the midst of finishing our first resurvey. We have baseline data from all these sites, and we've almost resurveyed them all. Uh, the pandemic pushed us back a little bit, but we hope this year to travel back to these two white dots. So that's uh, central Bhutan and western Nepal to finish this resurvey that's now lasted more than 17 years and around 1,700 kilometers. And what we've seen so far is uh, actually an increase in species. And this may at first seem to be a positive thing because we're also seeing an increase in useful species and medicinal species. However, at the same time, uh, this is one of the first signs of this shifting upwards in elevation that we expected to see and has the outcome of turning the alpine environments into these shrinking sky islands, similar to the way that sea level rise would shrink an island in the ocean. Um, and our interviews with local and indigenous people reflect these, these same things. They're finding medicinal plants uh, harder to locate. Alpine pastures are declining in qualities with sometimes trickle-down effects on their yaks and their sheep, trickle-down effects even onto things like snow leopard predation. Um, but of course, local and indigenous people are not passive observers of these things. We've uh, recorded and worked with people here to experiment with new crops and new methods to combine livelihood conservation with our biodiversity conservation. So um, going forward then, uh, we're really trying to um, continue to spread the word about the importance of incorporating these local perspectives into classical, ecological, and botanical work. We're trying to push the capacity and the leadership of these projects more and more local, which is the only way that projects can have a long-term life that reflects the long-term nature of climate change. And uh, we're trying to get our data into the hands of people who can make noise. So <laughs> land managers, advocates, policymakers, people who can actually affect change to the root causes of the things that we can only document. Thank you. What's my favorite part of the world? And you're doing great work in it, so I want to thank you for that personally. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, congratulations on this, and welcome. Um, 
and, and really thank you for pushing that idea of the local identity and, and in order for something to succeed, it's got to emanate from the people who live there. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't anybody run away. Uh, we have our last speaker for this session, and um, I just uh, – I, I know people have been introducing themselves, but Brandy DeCarly, who's going to be speaking, was with our first group of EC50 winners, and uh, she graciously joined us when we reviewed applications for the second round. So, you know, she's not only been a recipient, but helped shape this year's winner. So, Brandy. Thank you. I'm the last one standing between a break, so I'm going to dive in and, and keep it brief for everyone. Um, the development of agriculture some 12,000 years ago changed the way humans live. We switched from nomadic hunter and gatherer societies to permanent settlements with farming, which then gave way to cities and civilizations and bursting populations. Farming really paved the way for the stability and the security for the modern age to rise. Fast forward to today, and advances in technology have certainly enabled our food production to keep pace with our global population, but as we all know, this has come at an incredible environmental cost. With topsoil degradation globally and polluted waterways, and this centralized approach to our food system has left significant gaps in between who has access to food and who doesn't, which we know now with rising fuel costs makes it even more challenging. So we really think at this point we need to have infrastructural support systems to stabilize um, and localize our food production. So we built one. Um, Farm from a Box is a clean tech powered infrastructure for local and regional food production. We basically designed this as a modular infrastructure to drop in and support regenerative outdoor crop production virtually anywhere in the world. Um, each unit is entirely renewably powered, um, which also means that we can use technology to help accelerate a cleaner transition away from heavy polluting fossil fuel farm equipment to ultimately trying to achieve net zero, especially within the agricultural environment. Drip irrigation, as we know and we have heard changing weather patterns, we need these stabilizing components to make sure that the water is going to where it needs to go. And drip irrigation can not only save water, make sure that we're also extending the growing season and stabilize crop production through drought conditions. We also have internal cold storage to make sure that we're mitigating in-field crop loss. Um, lack of cold chain is a huge challenge globally, both here and overseas. And then on top of this, um, we built in a whole data system to make sure that we were connecting these communities with Wi-Fi access and other value-add tools like digital financial banking, digital market access, or using technology as a lever uh, to uplift global and regional farming. And here's the beautiful thing. Because our system is crop agnostic, that means we can grow absolutely any crop which means we can shift away from monocrop fields and instead really work with diversified crops that enhance biodiversity and tie in with culturally important foods and working with bioregionally adapted seeds. The other factor about this is it's bringing together modern technology, but basically with the old way of farming in a much more ecological way. So we talk about regenerative farming practices, but what is that? That's, that's what indigenous communities have been doing forever. So we're re basically wanting to bring the new together with the old. What does this enable? Food access is core to our well-being. It is so vital for our community strength, for our resilience, above and beyond nutritional security. So we're working throughout the United States and also in East Africa and now West Africa to be able to drop this infrastructure in and make sure that we're boosting up livelihoods, opportunity, and really strengthening what those food hubs are. The other factor with this that I do want to make sure that I mention is because we are a modular system, what we're now doing is deploying our system in volume to basically create a drop-in decentralized infrastructure for 
whole agricultural value chain. So we're surrounding refugee settlements with our system to make sure that we're uplifting not only nutritional security but livelihood opportunities and connecting STEM learning um, opportunities for the community as well. We're also working with indigenous communities here within the United States. And so if I leave you before we have our break, the, the union of technology and clean technology as an enabler for uplifting opportunities for people globally, but really reconnecting our food system, we can make farming again a stabilizing agent for prosperity for everyone equally across the board, and that's what we're working to do. So on behalf of myself and Scott Thompson, my business partner who's in the back, uh, we are deeply honored to be a part of the EC50 and to have participated in the second round too. So thank you very much. <laughs> Well, congratulations, and it's great to meet you in person. And this is such important work. And I'm, I mean, the levels uh, at which it operates from cultural to economic to political uh, can go by very quickly in a presentation like that. But it's really profound, and uh, you should be very proud. I'm glad of Zoom. I know you guys have seen each other on Zoom numerous times. I didn't realize this was the first time you were meeting, which is sort of the, the new future. Listen, we're going to break until um, 1 o'clock. I'd ask that you let, um, I know in food everybody, you know, thunderously herds out there. But EC people go and eat first because we do have people speaking afterwards. I want to make sure that they eat and, you know, you have time for conversation. But uh, please, um, lunch is served. Richard, get... Uh, we're going to do it at the very end. Very end. So EC50 people, please. Um, this is not a shy place. Please get to the front of the line.